Hello folks and welcome to episode 3, season 1 of Regen Earth. This is the podcast of the Regen Earth online conference on backyard regen, living soils. Now John and I are still busy filming and editing videos ready for the conference with another couple set to go this weekend. And speaking of John, I hear my co-presenter in the Highcliffe studio in northwestern Tassie. Hello John, welcome to the show. Hello one and all. Yes, I'm looking forward to this episode. Richard uh, honours one of my most admired individuals in the field, mm-hmm. Sergei Vavilov. Now, not many people know the name these days, but by the end of this episode, I'm sure you'll never forget the name nor the people he inspired. Gee, how was that for Billy? <laughs> <laughs> okay, John, who was Vavilov? Ah, uh, Mr Vavilov. Yes, he was an agricultural scientist in uh, Soviet Russia. Uh, his claim to fame is that he collected seeds, and he's got this seed collection in St. Petersburg where he was born, mm-hmm. but it was uh, Leningrad when he lived there, and now it's back to St. Petersburg, of course. Okay. But, yeah. And what's his claim to fame? This seed-saving business. He's uh, he, didn't just, he didn't just collect seeds. He went to the birthplaces of the food species to collect as many variations of the original you could almost say prototypes or um, right. pre, pre-domesticated pre types of seeds mm-hmm. so that we have the, the widest possible genetic variation. Okay. So how did he work? Well, basically he travelled. Um, he, he, he followed back the lines of expansion, so things like wheat and barley and those sorts of things. He traced back to what used to be called the Fertile Crescent or West Asia, uh, Iran, Iraq, Mesopotamia in uh, in older terms, and collected as many seeds as he could there. Uh, he spoke with locals, spoke to people that had been saving seed for generations. Yeah, yeah. And so he sort of worked anthropologically as well as agronomically. It was quite a feat, particularly yeah. when you consider the level of travel sort of at the start of last century. That would have been a massive uh, job there, John. So what, what did he end up achieving there? What was the what was the goal? Yeah, well, the idea was to have as wide a variation as possible of these first seeds mm-hmm. so that people could select for trays. So, you know, drought resistance, rust resistance, uh, wet season resistance, for want of a better phrase. And he yeah. ended up with a huge gra- um, library of these grain seeds that he kept in Leningrad, which is where he was working. Mm. And it's it was more than that, of course. But we'll, we'll just stick with the grains for the minute. Uh, he was um, quite obsessive about it, perhaps you'd say. But we're extraordinarily lucky that he did the work he did. Okay. And he ended up uh, falling out of favour, didn't he? He wasn't. <laughs> uh, so how did he end up dying, John? Well, he was a favourite of Lennon's, uh, mm-hmm. less so of. Uh, his successor, Stalin. So he ended up in a gulag during the Second World War. I think it was 43, 1943, he passed away. Mm -hmm. We're not exactly sure. Uh, He had a clash with uh, the other other great agronomist, I guess, is how the other fellow would see himself, by the name of Lysenko, who was Stalin's agronomist. Mm -hmm. Now, this fellow didn't believe in genes or, for that matter, the scientific method, but you look at his work, yeah. His theory was that if you took wheat in spring and buried it out in the the the, the step, let it be covered with snow all winter, and then dug it up in spring, it would germinate faster and produce more wheat. Mm-hmm. Now, all of the people that had lived on the step and grown wheat thought this was a bit, well, rubbish. Mm-hmm. But... <laughs> Lysenko knew his man and was able to convince Stalin and that he would be able to turn the Soviet Union into the the breadbasket of the world. Yeah. Now, unlike Vavilov, who actually went out and measured things and spoke to people, Lysenko wrote up his results before he'd even harvested the wheat. Okay. So we all know about, uh, in inverted commas, scientists that do things like that. Mm. So he, he became quite popular with Stalin because he was a hero of the Soviet Union and and showing that we didn't need this Western genetics idea. And because of the two of them, Vavilov and Lysenko sort of clashed, and Lysenko was closer to Stalin, Vavilov ended up in mm. the gulags, yeah. as did many people, of course. 
Now, the, the relevance of Lysenko is if we look at our current situation, re-climate change and whatnot, there's an awful lot of similar approaches to science and data that Lysenko used that are being used by deniers and people with vested interests. Mm. And we need more people like Vavilov that go to the data and the primary sources. It's um, it's a sad tale. But Vavilov's work lives on and there's hope. So we said that Vavilov met a sad end, as mm-hmm. you described, John. But what about his staff? What happened to them? Yeah, well, he set up this huge um, seed bank, basically, in Leningrad. And then, of course, Leningrad was a, a site of a, a rather large battle during the Second World War. I forget exactly how many days it went on for, but it was not good, and there was a lots of starvation. And yet, here in his institute, his staff stayed on, even though the shelling and the assaults and whatnot by the Germans and the counterattacks by the Russians. Yeah. And people were dying in their offices of starvation, surrounded by bags of rice and wheat that mm. Vavilov and his teams had collected across Eurasia because the importance of the work was, was greater than their own lives. It, it It's a commitment, isn't it? It gobsmacks me every time I say it or think about it, you know. it's. I wonder how many of us would be up for that. But, he, yeah, he inspired his people because the work they were doing was important. Yeah, yeah. You know? So, it, what, yeah. so, so John, was it, was it just seeds? Was it more? It was mostly seeds that he was started off with, but also he went off after the... Uh, the original apple trees and these sorts of things. He also collected soft fruits. Most of his work was across Eurasia, so sort of from Spain to to China Mm -hmm. was his compass, but he didn't get to all of those places. But, yeah, he had huge, huge collections of fruit trees and uh, soft fruits, uh, raspberries in particular. But, of course, these things you can't keep in bags like you can wheat seed, so they, they were planted out and harvested year in, year out, and have been up until now. So they still exist? Apparently, yeah. Yeah, from what I've seen. Yeah. Yeah. So what about, uh, we talk about legacy. I mean, that's an amazing story, John, but what about his legacy? Is his work safe from being destroyed? Well, yes and no, Rich. I mean, uh, we now have more seed banks around the world, inspired Mm. by the man, obviously. We've got the... um, the big one that comes to mind is the Svalbard Seed Vault up in Norway, yes. way up above the Arctic Circle. It's supposed to be safe from uh, climate disasters and whatnot because it's in the permafrost. But a couple of years ago, they had a warm spring, warm autumn, one mm-hmm. of those. And the, the Seed Vault itself was safe, but the entrance flooded. Oh, my word. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> and water oh, and stored seeds don't go well together. No, no. But... Uh, <clears throat> The, the seeds are safe, and there's also been a lot more of the, the seeds that Vavilov collected now spread around the world. There's some here in Australia. There was a lot in Syria, yes. uh, and people managed to get out samples of those to Svalbard and other places just as the Civil War was kicking off there. So people are aware that sudden changes in political activity can put a lot of these resources at um, at risk. Mm-hmm. And so there's a general push amongst the community of agronomists and, and seed specialists to make sure that the the insurance is there so that there's copies everywhere, yeah. for want of a better phrase. And but his, you... his fruit trees and his soft mm. fruits, as you can imagine, they, they take up a fair bit of land. And Leningrad, or St Petersburg as it is now, has grown somewhat since uh, the Second World War. And so his land is pretty much prime land, or the Institute's land is prime land, and there was a push a few years ago for it to be bulldozed and turned into um, apartment buildings and whatnot. Okay. It was overturned, thankfully. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's it's always a constant threat, these sorts of things. You, yeah, know, how the, you know how these systems work. There was that um, crocodile farm, uh, crocodile park they were going to put into... The Blue Mountains 20 years ago, they got knocked on the head. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's all right, the planning application's back before the council. Yes. You know, you've got to be vigilant with these things. And you know, Crocodile Park in the mountains is a, is a bit of a joke anyway, it's but this stuff with the seeds, yeah. Yeah. 
This stuff's really, really important. Mm. Because it's it's the food basket of humanity, basically, and we need to we need to uh, what's the word? We need to honour the work that Vavilov and his team did and the sacrifices they made. Yes, Please. and the the huge diversity that's available there. It's we, we need this stuff. And as you alluded to, John, just to underline again, uh, with the climate emergency that we are now experiencing. There's become an urgency to save seeds before they are completely destroyed or uh, climate changes so much that they're no longer viable. Uh, so this sort of work is just uh, an inspiration, as you say. So, well, thanks, John, first of all. that But that was an education. I really learnt a lot there. Thank you very much for that. Mm. And I think we'll all agree that we learnt a lot from today's episode. And, yeah, his work holds great relevance, as you say. Um yeah, and I think we need to maintain as much genetic variation as possible. We lost mm. so much in the 20th century with the Green Revolution, so-called, which was basically industrial agri- agriculture on steroids, and there were micro-adapted sp- seeds types all across the developing world that were just lost mm. as governments bought the IMF and World Bank funding to put this Green Revolution in place. Yes. So thankfully, a lot of these things might have survived in seed banks around the world, but many, many more were lost. And there's a, like there was an odd variety of rice that didn't produce as much as your standard hybridised version. Mm. But if you got floods, the plant kept growing to keep the top of it above water. So there's records of it surviving 10 and 12 metre floods. Mm. And then as the floods receded, people got their seed back plus enough to keep them alive, a little bit less than they'd normally eat, but enough to keep them alive till the next season. And that's a remarkable trade to have developed in a in, in a, a grain seed. I mean, it's and too too remarkable to be uh, to be destroyed, John, isn't it? Or just lost to be through, lost through mm-hmm. arrogance and, and mm-hmm. hubris. Yeah, but yeah, so these things are important. Um, and we can all save seed. That's the point. It's not that difficult. Some can, some seeds can be a little bit trickier than others. But uh, we have a seed saver presenting at the Regen Earth 2019 online conference, Backyard Regen, Living yes. Soil. Looking forward uh, to that, link, yep. <laughs> There's a link to that in the show notes, of course. If you're interested, we'd love to see you there. All right, and don't forget to... Yeah, check our show notes, as John says, for more details on sources for today's program and more info on our September online conference. So it's goodbye for now. And I'll see you next week.